Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome back. We are uh, in the module 5. In part 1 of module 5, we have looked at uh, various issues with regard to language acquisition, primarily first language acquisition and various factors that are integral part of language acquisition at that particular stage. So, we talked about critical period hypothesis, we talked about how the stages of language development are and then what are the theoretical standpoints and so on. We have also introduced the idea of the theory of mind, what is a theory of mind and we have seen that theory of mind basically is a precursor to a properly developed social cognition in children. Social cognition is the understanding of faiths and belief system and intention and you know predicting the behavior of others and so on and so forth. So, understanding oneself within a larger domain of constantly interacting individuals, constantly interacting um, uh, organisms and with respect to certain kinds of rules and regulations and so on and so forth. So, being aware of your circumstances, surroundings and so on is what basically refers to cogn social cognition. So, we have seen that theory of mind is the primary building block of that particular aspect of cognitive mechanism in human children and also that theory of mind is um, uh, developed pretty early in life. So, now we will take on, uh, we will move on with the same discussion and look at certain other um, aspects of theory of mind. So, we have, we have talked about what is theory of mind, theory of mind is about understanding that oneself, one's own uh, mind has its own ideas, belief system, behavioral pattern and so on and so forth. Similarly, identifying that others also have a set of belief. Um, understanding and so on and so forth and most crucially that these two can be different. So, my idea of a particular thing, my belief about a particular thing can be different, uh, my schema of understanding a particular notion, particular event, people name it, you name it anything else can be different from the other person. This is a very fundamental understanding with respect to human cognition. So, we have talked about the presence of this particular aspect in human children, but how do we really check, how do we really uh, find out whether a child is capable of exercising his theory of mind, that the child is um, having a theory of mind of its of his own and how do we really go about it in terms of research. So, whether a child is developing normally can be ascertained from various factors. We all know when, uh, when, when we see children developing through stages of you know whether it is linguistic development, whether it is social development and so on and so forth. It is not very difficult to tell that a particular child is typically growing and we can also differentiate between a typically growing child and a non-typically growing child. So, what are those factors that we immediately ascertain? Even if you are not a researcher, we all are capable of uh, kind of pointing out the factors. So, what are those factors? Most importantly, one of the most important uh, pointers for um, uh, differentiation between typical and atypical children will be language development. So, language development we have seen that by the age of 2, children are beginning to speak in, uh, in words and very fast, very quickly after, after 2 years of age, they will go on to the sentence stages. So, language is one important aspect here and another is social behavior and there are of course, multitude of other, other factors as well. 
Now, we have already seen theory of mind as a precursor to social cognition. So, because theory of mind precedes a fully developed social cognition as a result of which theory of mind also gives us a very important uh, indicator as to whether the child is growing normally or not. Now, theory of mind is an abstract notion. It is, it is a mechanism of the mind that makes us do things, that makes us be create self belief as well as understand others belief and so on and so forth. So, theory of mind per se cannot be checked. So, there are tasks that are designed around that idea to check whether the child has uh, developed his theory of mind or not. That is why theory of mind is important even in uh, this aspect. So, one of the most important test of theory of mind for children is what is called the false belief task. False belief task typically uh, is designed to, to check if the child is, a uh, you know, child can show his or her understanding of false belief as in what is uh, the belief system that he has can be different and the other person can be um, attributed a false belief even when the child knows it not to be true. So, this, uh, this false belief tasks are uh, various basically various versions of the initial false belief task which was the Sally and Anne story. So, what is a Sally and, Sally and Anne story? This is a depiction of Sally and Anne story. The child is shown these, the, the, these the picture cards and a series of events that takes place. So, what happens is that there are two characters, they can be two dolls, initially there were two dolls, but now it can be also animated. So, there is a person called Sally and there is a person called Anne. As you can see that Sally puts her uh, doll, uh, puts her red ball in the, um, in, the, in the basket. So, there is a basket and there is a box. So, Sally puts her red ball in the basket and then uh, leaves the room and sees it happening. And once Sally goes out of the room and takes the ball and places it into the box. So, replaces the ball from the basket to the box. Basically, what is happening here is in absence of Sally, Anne has moved the location of the ball of the referent here which is the ball. Now, Sally comes back. Till here the child is shown the pictures and the event series of event that is happening and then the question that will be put to the child is where do you think Sally will look for her ball? This is the question. It is a very simple story, very simple uh, thing that is happening here, but the remarkable finding in this kind of story, in this uh, false belief task is that children at age of 3 cannot pass this task whereas children at 4 can. So, basically what is happening here, what do we mean by passing the test? The test, the child will pass the test when he says, he or she says that the, um, the place where Sally will look for, for her ball is the basket because Sally does not know the ball has moved. But children uh, who are very small like three, around 3 years or before 3 years of age, they will say that the, that she will look for the ball in the box because the child sees the box as the container of the ball right now and he, she cannot ascribe the false belief in on to Sally. So, taking off the uh, belief system from one's own self and imposing it on others is still there. And so, this is, this is a point where the child has not been able to differentiate between the mental states of the observer from the mental state of the other person, in this case Sally. So, Sally has a different mental state as opposed to the child. Child has seen the ball moving, Sally has not. Very simple thing, very simple task. However, the remarkable finding is that irrespective of language, cultural background or any other criteria, children aged 4 can perform this task correctly and flawlessly. However, children at around 3 years of age cannot, which tells us that the understanding the theory of mind basically takes place in children around the age of 4. So, if a child cannot perform the false belief task correctly at age 4, then there is something uh, to be probed that is the point here. So, why, why is there a particular age which is almost universal that is at around age 4 children tend to develop the theory of mind. So, why is it like that? What is it about so, what is it so special about age 4 that 
makes children grow up, uh, uh, makes children develop theory of mind at that particular stage. So, there are two primary theoretical assumptions as to why it happens. One has to do with the language development. One school of thought, one particular theoretical aspect of it is that children, um, uh, this change from 3 year to 4 year in terms of um, you know, acquisition of theory of mind is dependent on the child's language development, because this is the age when the child starts mastering grammatical rules, in fact complex grammatical rules that includes embedding in a sentence, embedding in tense complement clauses and so on and so forth. So, that is the complex grammatical uh, structure that the child masters as a result of which it also has a an impact on the understanding of belief. So, I said to uh, Ram that he was not capable of passing this exam because and like this, this kind of a complex embedded sentence. So, that each each embedded uh, clause has its own subject, object and uh, verb and so on and so forth and there is also a matrix clause. So, by the time the child has mastered these grammatical rules of understanding the matrix clause along with the embedded clauses and their you know finer nuances, it means that is when the child is able to negotiate complex relationship between various agents and their actions. And this is understood to be a, a reason why children develop theory of mind also at the same time. This was the theory. However, we also have some counter uh, to this, uh, to this uh, uh, theoretical standpoint. There are some recent findings do not support this link between understanding sentence complements and theory of mind. In fact, there have been studies that uh, checked on young children um, who are very well, who, who do very well on syntax and semantic tasks are still not able to pass the false belief task if they are around 3 years of age, because some children have uh, faster language development as opposed to others. So, even when children have mastered the complex grammatical rules of you know embedding, um, embedding and uh, difficult complex clauses, even then they are not able to pass the theory of mind task, I mean the false belief task at that age. So, this has to be something else, this is probably not dependent on the language uh, development, stages of lam language development. So, the second theory is that theory of mind develops at a time which is in conjunction with other cognitive developments. So, this is uh, the what are the other cognitive developments? This is typically has to do with the inhibitory processes and pragmatic skills of general purpose cognitive mechanisms. So, basically when the child as we have seen by um, the theories of Jean Piaget that children go through various stages of cognitive development. So, at this age they are developing the, their inhibitory skills, their executive function mechanism and other pragmatic skills. So, that is when it goes uh, it is it goes without saying that this also has a um, has a uh, result in developing their theory of mind. And there are of course, there are many finer nuances in each of these theories, but this is roughly the two assumptions with respect to why children develop theory of mind at a particular age. Now, whatever the theoretical account is, it seems that the child's performance on story based theory of mind reasoning depends on the child's exposure to language, exposure to verbal communication, verbal or nonverbal communication systems that teaches them that people have beliefs that are different from their own. Now, this is a very big claim to make. Um, so, what, what we are trying to say here is that irrespective of whatever theory you uh, go by, it is that it is certain that children do develop theory of mind uh, based reasoning skills at a particular age. However, one interesting uh, twist to is, is, is that that language does have an impact even if it is not the grammatical aspect of language, but the exposure to conversations in the environment it uh, seems to be a very important pointer towards developing of um, this kind of a reasoning system. The reason being that conversations typically more often than not humans talk about other humans, more often than not only sages and great uh, intellectuals um, uh, will talk about great things, but at a normal level most people lesser mortals like us we talk about other humans. So, while, while we talk about other humans what we are basically doing is we are talking about different mental states 
as different from us or as similar to us. So, we will talk about human agents as carrying different mental states, different belief system, different understanding, different knowledge base and so on and so forth. So, this is the important takeaway that children understand from those conversations and hence conversations around children is extremely important uh, to develop their theory of mind. Now, this is not entirely uh, just a speculation, there is a there is a very strong support, empirical support for this uh, kind of a reason line of reasoning. This uh, one of the strongest support comes from data on uh, uh, data that is uh, from the work on deaf children from different kinds of backgrounds. Deaf children from sign language uh, environment versus deaf children from um, verbal language environment. So, deaf children um, from sign language environment have been found to be doing better in theory of mind uh, based reasoning as opposed to deaf children from verbal language environment. The reason is that deaf children from sign language environment have early exposure to others conversation about people's beliefs and so on. And that is the reason they are uh, understood to be doing better. In contrast, deaf children of hearing parents um, commonly do not exp are exposed to conversations early. The reason is that the parents who are you know, who have who are not deaf and mute will be using verbal language among themselves. So, a lot of conversation that small children are exposed to are not directed at them. That is, a large number of it is the conversations that are happening around them without including the children. So, in case of deaf children with speaking parents, parents will be talking among themselves or with other members of the family or whoever is their environment. The deaf children being uh, unable to take part or you know being included in, the, in that conversation misses out on those crucial input of how humans talk about one another. And that is one reason. So, the findings uh, finding has uh, uh, proven that this is the case. So, deaf children are con doing considerably uh, worse in signing environment uh, in, uh, in the environment of speaking, speaking parents as opposed to deaf children in the sign language environment. Because sign language environment for uh, the other case where they are not doing well is an environment that they get only when they go to school special needs school for example. So, that is that delays the conversational input for those children. So, this is a, a very uh, important uh, domain from where proof for conversational um, the, uh, the lingu language environment in terms of conversation having a role in development of theory of mind has been shown. So, the to, to uh, connect theory of mind and language, uh, we can say that mental states cannot be observed directly. That is true for any kind of mental state, whether it is theory of mind or any other uh, kind of uh, state. So, nor there is any simple correlation between mental states and observable behavior. There is no one to one mapping. So, only valuable way to learn about this elusive content is to listen how people talk about the mind, what we what do we say about what are the workings of the mind. So, Research in developmental psychology suggests the importance of verbal communication in developing a theory of mind that we have already seen. Of course, this um, the data uh, spans a diff all kinds of different uh, domains of research. We have only given the example of deaf children, but there are uh, various um, other domains. So, language ability seems to predict success in false belief task independent of age. So, there is this a uh, uh, particular angle also. Though in typical cases it is 4 years of age, but if we will if we'll take other variables into consideration, then language ability is, uh, uh, is a very crucial uh, predictor of the theory of mind in irrespective of age also. So, a, chi a child who has not developed language uh, as at par with his, uh, his or her um, uh, other, other children of, of the same age may also lack the development of theory of mind appropriate for his or her age. So, it is not just the conversational input, but also language the resultant language developmental stages of the child that predicts the theory of mind relation uh, theory of mind development. So, this is how the relationship has been uh, seen. And a similar correlation was also found in both healthy children and children with autism and other developmental disorders. So, language 
there are two things here. One, on the one hand, the the environment in which conversational input is a constant uh, thing for the child, growing child, that is one input, which results in development of language and which is a uh, important predictor of the theory of mind, uh, of the of the development of theory of mind in children. And this is this is uh, consistent in findings across um, uh, normal as well as atypical children. Atypical children, as in children who have certain ki kind of developmental disorder. So this is about theory of mind. Let's now move on to yet another extremely important um, um, aspect of language development in ch in uh, in both children and adults, but we are uh, mostly focusing on children here. That, uh, that is of joint attention. What is joint attention? It is very simple thing. Joint attention refers to the eye movement in which two people use their gaze or gestures to show an object or event in the space for the purpose of interaction. So, basically when the there are two people or more than two people, they are talking about the same thing they have to talk about the same thing. So, one person refers to it and the other person's attention is also drawn towards it. How do we know that the attention is drawn? Primarily because of the eye movement. So, if both the participants in a conversation is are looking at the same object and, uh, and then they engage in a conversation on that object, this is what is basically uh, showing us that they are jointly attending to that particular uh, referent. So, it is not only about uh, eye movement, there is also there are also other ways to achieve joint attention such as gesture, pointing, verbal and as well as non-verbal means. All those uh, non-linguistic uh, means when we talk about uh, a particular object. So, when a typical, uh, typical uh, example would be in a classroom, the teacher will be showing the slides and you know, point with a pointer, the, we will be pointing towards certain aspects of the slides and basically trying to uh, trying to draw the attention of the students to the same thing. So, at the, say the teacher and the students are jointly attending to the same object because we have to interact on that particular uh, topic. So, this is just this is the notion of joint attention. It has been said that the ability to share a common point of reference develops the in the first year of life. In fact, there is a lot of interesting research happening in that uh, we have already talked about it before while talking about developmental stages the children develop uh, the attentional mechanism in children develops remarkably early in life in fact by 6 months 9 months and so on so joint attention behavior basically falls into two categories there are two kinds uh, there are two aspects of joint attention one is responding to joint attention another is initiating joint attention so while uh, other conversation conversation partners are talking about a particular um, object the third participant also responds to the joint attention or in some cases it can the participant can initiate a joint attention so both are crucial in um, in any conversation setup or any you know getting for any goal, goal directed behavior. So, RJA refers to the ability of infants to follow the gaze or gestures of others in order to attain the common point of reference. So, the mother will be showing to some showing some toy or something to the child and the child responds by looking at the same object a very simple example of um, RJA among infants. Similarly, IJA refers to the infant's behavior in which they themselves initiate the post gestures or the gaze to di direct others attention towards that object or event. This is something this is this has been a very uh, interesting area of research um, on, on infants of late. So, chill how do chill, what are the mechanisms children put in place infants put in place in order to engage others attention. So, that is what the initiating joint attention refers to. So, this looks somewhat like this. So, it is identified at the as the early stage of language learning. Any kind of learning, any kind of um, engagement of a participant in a scenario automatically presupposes joint attention. So, if we are learning language, it is also dependent on joint attention. So, this is one of the earliest stages of language learning. In order to learn a novel word, novel word as in a new word, infants follow the gaze of their parents to know about the reference. So, this is kind of a set, set up where you have the uh, infant and the and the child sitting uh, you know for uh, looking at each other and the parent is uh, 
trying to teach him or her the name of a particular object and then this the, the, the parent will be pointing towards the object in this case let us say it is a ball. So, this is the referent and child also follows the gaze of the parent and therefore, both of them are um, you know they are uh, they are engaging their joint attention on the referent of the word the ball or the bat or the flower or whatever. This is at the very core of learning in this case language learning. So, until and unless the child is um, shown what it what it means to what is the referent of an of a, of a word the child will not be able to learn the uh, what it means the meaning of it. So, several studies directly relate joint attention to language acquisition that is frequency with which children engage in joint attention shows the ability their ability to uh, of language acquisition that is understood because if the child does not engage their attention. So, basically the finer nuances of um, uh, engaging and disengaging and re-engaging their attentional mechanism with respect to the caregiver is what is at, a, at the core of learning mechanism which is also true for language mechanism language learning mechanism. So, if the child is not capable of directing attention it will automatically hamper his or her learning uh, trajectory. It is also related to mental and behavioral process and facilitate learning ability and development as has been pointed out by uh, these researchers. And it is also said to be an outcome of uh, integration of posterior attentional mechanism and anterior attentional mechanism. These are just some details um, posterior attentional mechanism and anterior attentional system which uh, and each of them are related to either RJA or to the uh, to IJA. So, Posner's work in this uh, in this area has been very influential. This is what uh, in a graphic way this will look at. So, this is what is cognition, the attention is one part of cognition and then there are these two kinds of systems that are coming together to create joint attention in, uh, in these two domains and ultimately it this whole process that, that is taking place in your in the mind of the child gradually will lead, lead to a social behavior, social cognition resulting in behavior behavior as in whether it is linguistic behavior or non-linguistic social behavior and so on. So, basically engaging the whole thing ultimately comes down to engaging with other agents in the same environment, engaging in a way the, you know that is geared towards a goal directed behavior, whether in uh, whether the goal directed behavior is with respect to learning language or you know in a in engaging in a conversation or some kind of an interaction and cooperation, it can be anything any of these things, but basically it is a social uh, sort of an interaction. And so, basically if you are if your attentional mechanism is geared towards these processes then it will gradually give rise to what we call social cognition and social behavior. So, that brings us to another important um, uh, part, these, these are not different from one another, they are intertwined with each other. So, theory of mind is the precursor to social cognition on the one hand and uh, we have already seen that attentional mechanism in terms of joint attention is also at the core of creating social cognition. So, these are smaller parts of the larger picture of what is called social cognition. Social cognition focuses on the mental and behavioral process of people about other people and circumstances. So, basically an a social awareness sort of thing. So, the, the awareness of oneself and one's belief system activities and behavioral output and so on and understanding the others uh, the same things in others in a particular given circumstance that is the uh, that is what is called social cognition. So, it includes the role of cognitive processes in social interaction that is what we just saw. So, it this entire gamut of things which is actually not very simple as we have just seen it includes it, it requires for uh, the child to, to develop social awareness at the very early age in terms of TOM as well as you know, uh, gearing that uh, attentional mechanism all these processes start at a very early age of um, they have been already found in children around 9 months of age infants. It starts to develop uh, even earlier, the latest research shows that it probably develops even earlier, but 9 to 12 months by 9 to 12 months definitely it is in place. So, both uh, joint attention is in place and theory of mind gradually develops by the age of 4 and so on. 
social cognition model argues that as an infant monitor and uh, represent their own goal related intentional activities, they also monitor and represent the goal related activity of others. This is what if you bring it down to the particulars. So, not only their activities and their goal related behavior, but also the same in others. Like infants understand their own feeling, they also become able to comprehend the mental state of others. This is fundamental. Until and unless the child is aware of its own goal that she wants the attention of the mother, what does we think children are crying for no reason. Small children they have only one output right that is uh, whether they are hungry, they are thirsty, they, are, they want attention, they want to play, they want whatever that the, the output is the same children crying. But what is happening here is that the child is utilizing the only system that ha that it has at, at its disposal for its goal for whatever the goal at that particular moment is. So, by crying or certain kinds of hands and legs movement or cooing depending on what stage of life it is in, they will try and attract the attention of the primary caregiver. So, which means the moment you are trying to attract attention of others that means the child's brain is already aware that it has a I uh, know it has its own goals, it has its own intentions and there are behavioral outputs that might affect those mechanisms in the other human being. Until and unless the child is aware, the brain of the child is aware of these activities, they will not engage in this kind of, uh, in this kind of uh, activities. So, they are capable of understanding these fundamental things at a very, very early age in the uh, in infancy. So, joint attention and social cognition then. Uh, we will talk about it in case of typical and atypical children. So, social cognition is the outcome of joint processing of information as we have just seen about the attention of self and others. Social cognition is necessary for the development of functional um, joint attention in infants. Thus, it has equal uh, importance in both categories of joint system which as we have also seen. So, there are two kinds of attentional mechanism both has to be in place for a proper development of social cognition in children. It has been characterized in clinical research that impa impairment in initiated joint attention that is IJA leads to diseases such as autism in children. So, the one of the reasons one of the uh, uh, let us say precursor to what is ultimately called autism basically can be traced back to the um, the true and Im to, to an impairment in IJA, they are not capable of initiating joint attention. So, such children um, it means that the child is not capable of um, initiating attention, such children are referred to as atypical children, atypical as in children who are not developing typically in a normal circumstances. So, there is a lack of uh, uh, the social cognition, but which we understand as the uh, result of not being able to initiate IJA. So, a typical child then refers to the children who are different from the same age children in terms of behavior development and so on. So, development uh, leads to be differential behavioral pattern. So, whereas typical child exhibits the normal generic behavior um, uh, generic behavior and development compares to the peers of the same age. So, we will see that all children start uh, know, uh, engaging in pretend play around the same time. Then language development happens on the same trajectory more or less roughly there is a pattern, but a child who is not part of that general generic pattern is typically called the atypical child. So, autism is one of the most common uh, disorder, disorder of neural development, primary cognitive deficit in social cognition defines all features of autism. So, if you uh, notice an autistic child, the uh, most telltale sign is the lack of social cognition and that that is of course, connected to what we have just seen as IJA. So, these are some of the pointers, some of the symptoms that atypical children will be exhibiting in early childhood. Uh, severe difficulty in social interaction, difficulty in verbal and non-verbal communication, uh, lacks in initiating attention and so on. So, uh, because of joy, uh, lack of joint attention, they will also lack the ability to share common point of reference and they will also not have, uh, you know, there is a limited eye contact and so on. So, all these basically take us back to the 
theory of mind, development of theory of mind and the joint attentional mechanism. So, this is what um, and both of which are connected to language at different levels. So, even typical uh, typical growth of a child uh, and, the, and the atypical population also has a link to language in this way. Now, uh, since we have focused mostly on uh, first language acquisition, we will quickly go over language acquisition in the in second language L 2 here refers to second language acquisition. So, second language acquisition is um, second language second language acquisition refers to the language that we learn after the first language. So, this is um, different from first language in many many ways it is not the same the processes are not same the trajectories are not same. However, as we will see some of the important pointers are still similar. So, learning an uh, L 2 typically is done after you have learnt L 1 that is first language. So, learning of L 2 follows the learning of uh, first language as a result of which it is also learnt at a later age. So, learning an L 2 by children is that is why qualitatively different from childhood bilingualism as well. Childhood bilingualism refers to those children who learn two languages simultaneously in the same environment. So, for example, a child growing up in a multilingual household where parents speak different languages or maybe there are other caregivers who speak another language. So, that is a, that is a scenario where the child can learn two languages simultaneously that is again a different type of uh, scenario. So, first language and second language following one another versus two languages being learned together there is a difference as in the case of L 2 being learned after L 1. So, there are three ki kinds of language acquisition we are talking about here. A majority of work in second language acquisition that is SLA has focused on adult learners primarily, but also the same theories are now being utilized for children uh, for child uh, L 2 learners and there are um, there are uh, similarities, there are differences and there are also of course, a lot of um, agreements and disagreements on this, but however, there is a uh, new focus on children learn children SLA childhood SLA as well. So, the main issues with adult SLA like childhood SLA center around the two primary um, uh, criteria of age and input. Age uh, let us let this will take you back to the critical period hypothesis age the um, refers to at what age the second language has been uh, learnt by the learner. Adult learners as a result of which often fail to acquire native like competence in the second language. This has always been a very important point of discussion in language acquisition research, second language acquisition research that adult learners that is the learners who have uh, who are adult who started learning their L 2 at an adult age, they fail to attain native like competence. So, native like competence was considered uh, the hallmark of your uh, proficiency level. So, if are you a good enough speaker of second language which may, will mean that your second language competence uh, fluency is as good as the native speaker of that language, which of course, now has been discredited that native like competence it cannot be the uh, goal of a, of a bilingual, because a bilingual is not two monolinguals you know somehow fused together. Bilingualism is a very completely different mental state altogether. The second language has a different status here, it is not like it was native speakers of two language. However, this uh, this the, and that is why this has now been discredited. Uh, so, ultimately what we now call um, this is called ultimate attainment. So, uh, now, now we now researchers are not talking about native like competence anymore it is called ultimate attainment that is the best the best approximation of co competence that the adult SLA learner can have in the second language. However, there has been a lot of research in terms of why the second language learner adult second language learner uh, I, I is not able to learn certain aspects of the second language. Is it because of the age? Because by virtue of being an adult learner, he has he or she has automatically crossed the critical period hypothesis. So, as a result of which a lot of these research these different kinds of research will attribute those uh, so called um, you know the defects or failures in uh, adult SLA uh, learners 
to the age 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 uh, um, uh, age factor that is the critical period that which takes us back to the critical period hypothesis so they put it like you know uh, because they have crossed the critical period so as a result of which the adult learners have um, incomplete access to the universal grammar remember we talked about universal grammar of chomsky so after the critical period the learners do not have adequate access to the universal grammar and also because after that age less effective procedural learning takes place as a result of which these two factors have been attributed. On the other hand quality and quantity of uh, input have also been pointed out as a serious problem because the, the child learner has a larger span of time for language input to come in as opposed to an adult learner simply because he has started learning the language much later. So, the amount of input that the adult learner receives is significantly less. So, this could be yet another reason as to why the adult learners will not uh, probably learn the language to the um, ultimate extent. And yet another um, notion that has been put forward recently is the identification with the L2 community. Because when you are learning the first language, you are part of the community that is why you are learning it as the first language. This is the language uh, in which you are born, into which you are born. So, this is your own community. In case of L2, it may not always be the case. So, once we, when you do not identify with the speech community, this might also be a reason as to why we are not able to uh, um, uh, uh, attain that native like competence in second language. However, there have been many recent studies which have uh, refuted the claims that um, the L2 learners cannot do as well as native speakers on various grammatical tasks. So, there has been a plethora of studies uh, comparing native speakers of a language and uh, with, with the L2 learners of the same language. So, let us say uh, L, L English speakers who are native speakers of English versus uh, non-native speakers of English like Indians. So, we speak English as our second or the third language. So, comparing a British speaker of English uh, with an Indian speaker of English and on various grammatical tasks and on under various conditions uh, by manipulating various kinds of uh, paradigms, they have found that this may not be always the case. There are differences sometimes found, but there are also sometimes uh, there are also some uh, very important research findings that point to the fact that the in there are in some grammatical uh, aspects in some grammatical uh, cases in case of certain kinds of tasks native speakers and non native speakers do almost similarly. So, non native speakers are able to match the native speakers in certain grammatical tasks which means it is not entirely true that L adult learners of L2 will not be uh, competent, uh, competent speakers of the language. However, there are differences in certain cases and these differences are uh, basically explained through uh, the nuances of grammatical aspects and other factors related to the learners like motivation, like input, like interactional context and so on and so forth. So, yes there are differences, but there are also similarities between native and non-native um, uh, speakers of, uh, of the second language. So, uh, the other variables of course, uh, will be input, the kind of input. Uh, Mm. So, for example, if the L2 is learnt as a foreign language as opposed to a second language. So, English taught as a foreign language versus English taught as a second language, EFL versus EF, uh, EFL versus ESL um, uh, learn te teaching mechanisms also will be important in this case. So, the input is very important and also because the when you talk about second language, it is more often than not taught, it is taught in a formal surrounding. But also sometimes people do pick up second language in the social environment. So, that brings in another you know angle to it. So, the, the, the interactional context in which the second language is learned, is it a formal context, is it an informal context, what kind of input are given and then the motivation of the learner. Motivation is a very, very important factor in second language acquisition research that why should the person learn a second language. For example, the motivation to learn English in Indian context is very, very important because this is a language of opportunities, whether it is job, it is you know social security and so on and so forth, economic betterment and so on. So, these are other variables, it is not always the age which decides. 
So, we see that in case of second language learning also there is a, a mixture of um, uh, various kinds of pointers. On the one hand you have social uh, uh, aspects, on the other hand you have the grammatical aspects on the on simultaneously age and other cognitive apparatus as well. Now, we move on to yet another important uh, uh, aspect of pragmatic competence in terms of language acquisition. So, pragmatics is the study of uh, contextual meaning rather than the lexical meaning. So, a sentence may be meaningful in its own right as in lexical meaning might be perfect, but it is not contextualized properly. So, the meaning in context refers to pragmatics. So, pragmatic meaning can be different from uh, lexical meaning often. So, this is the notion from where pragmatic competence comes in. What we mean by pragmatic meaning versus lexical meaning is um, one good example would be that in grammar in, in Hindi grammar we are taught that um, you know for children small children you can say there are, there is a, this three way pronoun system in Indian languages tu, tum and aap. So, aap is for aap is reserved it is an honorific term aap is reserved for people who are older to you or somehow more respectable to you by virtue of some kind of a social uh, system or uh, you know uh, respectable in whatever way in many ways. So, if aap is reserved for that kind of people, tum is more uh, like friendly kind of a gesture and tu is reserved for uh, smaller children, people who are younger to you, very close friends and so on and so forth. So, it will be perfect to say to a child. Um, tum khalo ya tu khale and so whatever. But if you see, so it is grammatically fine, it is uh, lexically fine to ta to tell a child to eat hey, tum khalna khalo. But in uh, pragmatically speaking in certain parts of the country, it is not so common to use tum, it is very common to use aap with children in many parts of um, Uttar Pradesh for example. So, it is very common for uh, mothers to uh, use aap with their children. Uh, uh, in the same circumstances. So, so, that is pragmatic competence. So, that brings us to what is pragmatically uh, more relevant, more, more, uh, more context appropriate. So, the notion of pragmatic competence refers to the ability to use language appropriately in its socio-cultural context. This is something that we have been uh, talking about from the beginning, that language is a complex thing. Language is not just a set of rules as Chomsky would have us believe that it is just a set of rules that the native speakers know how to manipulate and that is all about language. It is not. Language is not spoken in a vacuum. Language is spoken in a context, in a socio-cultural context. We have to not only convey the meaning we are trying to convey, but also we have to convey it in an appropriate way, appropriate as in socio-culturally appropriate way. So, that is where the pragmatic competence comes in. So, pragmatic um, competence is one of the effective way, most effective way of communication. In fact, it is the only way of effective communication. That is why often we uh, we see that the, the comic relief used in Hindi, Bollywood Hindi films that make fun of uh, Bengali speakers of Hindi or Gujaratis uh, or Punjabis. These are the communities that are, were always targeted. So, and that the use is always language. So, the way they socio-culturally inappropriate way of using language or so, so and so on and so forth. So, it is uh, very uh, the, in order for your communication to be effective, you need to be it needs to be socio-culturally uh, put. Uh, uh, socio-culturally uh, appropriately boxed. So, in case of second language it has to be um, it has to be uh, very carefully uh, the target language has to be understood very carefully in this context. Pragmatic competence is also a useful notion in first language. It is not only in case of second language because language socialization is what we are looking at language and the relationship of the society in which it is used. And only when and when we do not use it in an appropriate fashion is when we have a comic, some uh, usually comic, but sometimes it can even go beyond that scenario. So, in second language acquisition, it is defined as the ability to produce and comprehend the language appropriately in the social context. It is it may not be you know I mean if you say if you were uh, new to U P and you you, you just uh, or as it is very often the case Bengali speakers of um, Hindi often omit 
the honorific in while referring to the father or the husband and so on and so forth primarily because that does not exist in Bengali. Bengali um, the husbands will not use tu for wife uh, nor the wife will use up for the husband. This, this, this exists in some other languages, but not in Bangla. So, in Bangla it is tum for in both ways. Now, the same thing if you uh, transport to Hindi speaking scenario, it will create a lot of problems. Uh, it will almost appear like you are not respecting your husband enough. So, these are the situations. So, in target language, one has to be always careful about what is socially appropriate in that language, not just translate uh, the uh, L1 situation to the L2 situation. Thus, in the case of both L1 and L2 learning and use, the knowledge of social norms and cultural schema are very, very crucial and underlining the social cognition and language relationship. So, that is yet another way of looking at the language and cognition relationship in this case the social cognition. So, you have looked at the cognition in terms of uh, mental mechanisms like attention and so on and then social cognition. Some latest uh, uh, to in order to take care of you know the whole uh, meta uh, meta system here, what is happening, what happens in case of language learning, some recent developments have taken place, uh, which has taken a step ahead in terms of how to get the data, child language acquisition data. So, what uh, all our findings till now, one of them, one aspect of them are referring to the recordings of the child's uh, developmental stages by typically a linguist who is also the parent of the child. So, they will take down, they will note down, you know, they maintain a diary of the stages of development of their own child. Now, that is one and on the other hand, there will be experimental studies. So, in both cases, what happens is that these are observations and they are more like snapshots in time. So, you know, ap, uh, after a brief period of time, then ag again after a gap, then again after a gap. So, you do not see a sequence of events as it unfolds in real time. What we see is snapshots of different stages of the different uh, developmental trajectories. So, to take care of these, uh, to take care of such a uh, problem in, in the, uh, in the, in the, uh, uh, the lack of naturalistic observational recording, naturalistic as in when the child is growing up in a in its own environment and how the uh, all the other you know surrounding aspects of his development also has an impact on the language development of the child, it is very, very difficult to um, record. So, there is very less information in that domain. All we have is the observation from the other people. In order to take care of this, uh, there is now a uh, the latest uh, there is now a, a different take on this whole uh, problem altogether. One of them is the well known speech home corpus from MIT uh, Media Lab by Dave Roy. Uh, what uh, this particular uh, researcher who has uh, has done is is that he had fitted his whole home with the with multitude many uh, cameras and uh, microphones and so on and so forth and recorded the data of his own child's development from zero to three years of age which has resulted in a huge amount of audio visual data, but this is natural data as the child was moving uh, you know growing from one uh, from infancy to 3 years of age and what are the linguistic developments, what all also happened around him, what are the conversational input he got, what are the other kinds of um, you know inputs and so on and so forth. So, studies like this the speech home corpus one can look up um, just look up uh, Deb Roy. The data I am referring to here is a little old, uh, by now uh, he might have, he would have definitely gone ahead with uh, all the all the analysis done also. So, is this a way forward? This is another um, important way to look at it. Is this, so the data till now whatever we have is already you know it is it is very fascinating, it, the findings are very interesting, but is this a move, uh, this, uh, this kind of a move is a way forward, do we need more of this kind of um, recordings in order in, in natural setup, in natural setup that gives us a good observational uh, recording, because only then we will be able to find out the interactions between the child, be, between the child as a growing organism and its surroundings and how the developmental trajectory in cognitive, uh, neurocognitive as well as sociocognitive and linguistic terms interact in real time. 
So, to summarize what we can say from this entire uh, segment in this module about language learning in various scenario whether it is first language or second language learning, what we can say is that language acquisition research proves the intertwined nature of language with other cognitive mechanisms as well as socio pragmatic concerns. This is for where we uh, started with. So, uh, neurocognitive mechanisms like attention, attention in terms of joint attention and then uh, cognitive developmental stages and also how we interrelate these functions with socio pragmatic concerns. The kind of input that we get and the way the, uh, the growing child interacts with the environment in terms of either being a passive uh, listener to conversations in the environment or engaging the attention of other people and thereby growing and so on and so forth. So, these are language learning like any other language function cannot be understood in a vacuum, it has to be understood and has to be studied and uh, in terms of its relationship with many other mechanisms like these. So, this is about um, language acquisition, these are the references. Thank you.